So I wear gloves when I'm painting, uh, just because um, I'm, I've got a bit of a uh, skin um, eczema, so that just makes it worse if I get uh, chemicals on it. Although I don't actually use um, solvents in the studio, I will do when I'm painting outside. Uh, I actually use walnut oil for my solvent to uh, clean my brushes. So I'm just going to switch round so you can see I'm painting from life. Um, so that the subject that you can see on the bottom left, uh, it's just obviously just a photograph. And um, this is the live feed. Um, so um, that's actually what I'm working from. The, so the photograph is just for your reference. So you can see uh, what I'm actually referring to when I'm painting. So the board is, um, it's a, like a high density fibre board, a bit like MDF, uh, but it's a bit tougher. And then it's just being coated with two coats of um, oil primer. Uh, it takes about a week to dry. Um, and then on my palette, I'll just quickly go through what colours I've got laid out. Um, so I've got lemon yellow. I probably won't use all these, but I've got lemon yellow. As a, uh, that's cadmium yellow medium. Um, that's also cadmium yellow. There's slightly different hues of cadmium yellow medium. Cadmium yellow deep, cadmium red, uh, rose madder in... Uh, I think that's quinquedone red, I'm not sure about that. Uh, magenta, transparent oxide red, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, and then Payne's grey. And then uh, I've got a medium he here, um, which is basically a mix of linseed stand oil and uh, OMS in about one to four parts. So when at the beginning of the painting, I tend to use a uh, medium to make the paint flow a bit better, and then I'll probably use less as the painting uh, goes on. So the first thing I need to do um, the first thing I need to do is to uh, just study my subject quickly. I've obviously already done that because I set it up earlier. Um, and uh, what I'll do is ju I'll just squint at the subject just to try and simplify it. So when I'm squinting, what I'm trying to do is simplify the values. So when I teach in my workshop, because of the structure is in three parts, the, for the foundation, which I call the, the, um, the visual hierarchy, is like a pyramid. On the base of that hierarchy, you've got like things like composition, your idea, your concept. And then um, that quite close to the bottom is uh, something called values, which you might have heard of if, you, if, you've, done, if you've been painting a while or um, read books about it. So values is basically how dark or light something is. Um, so when we talk about colour... We want to try and be a bit more uh, precise in our language. So when we say colour, we can actually break up the the, as the, uh, um, the aspects of colour into three components, which is value, um, chroma, which is the sometimes called saturation or brightness, and hue, which is like red, green, blue, etc. Um, so those three components make up what we normally refer to as colour. So the most important of those in terms of uh, representing light, because I'm a representational painter, not an abstract painter, um, is to do with value. So um, sometimes you'll see a value scale of, say, 1 to 9. This is quite arbitrary, uh, but usually um, 1 to 9 or 1 to 10 or 1 to 5. Uh, these are sc value scales where you go from the darkest dark, say, to your lightest light that your the pigments on your palette can manage. So... Um, so my darkest dark would be, say, a combination of transparent oxide brown and ultramarine blue, and obviously my lightest light would be white. I can't, doesn't, I can't go beyond that value range. Um, that's the limit of my pigments. But when I observe my subject, sometimes, uh, depending... Um, turn up the light a bit. Uh, depending on um, what kind of light in situation you're in, uh, you, your value range in, the, in nature might be well beyond what your pigments are actually capable of. So then the, that's where the artist's interpretation begins. So I need to interpret what I'm seeing in the subject and be able to translate that onto the 2D panel, uh, onto a 2D, you know, a flat surface. Um, so uh, it's not a process of just copying uh, what I see because uh, that's not going to work. Uh, the same also applies to the other aspects of colour, chroma and hue, because uh, nature, can, again, can exceed, generally, 
what I can achieve in terms of chroma. Uh, sometimes I, I can you can usually um, manage different hues, but sometimes subtlety of hue can be a problem as well. Um, obviously, with flowers, they tend to be they can be very highly chromatic. Um, in this particular subject, the chroma is not too high, um, and um, so anyway, I, I could talk a lot more, but I want to crack on now. So. Um, so I've got some more people to admit. Okay. Um, so as I said, if you want to pop any questions in the chat or just unmute yourself to ask a question, uh, go ahead. So I'm just going to make it start. So the first thing I'm going to do now is actually just to start drawing. So when I say draw, basically what I mean is that I'm going to start marking out the big shapes. So uh, not, sometimes I'll have a tint on here. So I haven't got one today because uh, I didn't have a panel available. I'm just making up some new panels. So what I'm going to do, oh, I forgot to mention, I've got a pile of paint here. Uh, it's, just, it's just off camera, actually. So this is actually just a mix of all my paints at the end of the session. I keep it and put it in a little box with a clove oil to keep it wet. And uh, basically, it just makes a really good uh, neutral mid-tone grain. So I can actually use this on... Um, as like a basis so I'm just going to actually quickly scrub some of that in um, with a bit of medium just to knock back the white because the, the the white of the panel can be a bit off-putting when you're trying to judge value so I'm going to keep that fairly thin and just scrub that in with a tissue So this panel is just held on with uh, some screws. So you can see this is the actual painting panel and I've got some screws here and it's on a separate board. Uh, you can't see the edges there but it's just on a separate piece of uh, MDF and it's screwed into. Um, I like this setup because it means I can get right to the edge of the panel when I'm painting. It's something uh, I picked up from Mark Voges who you may know of, the lands uh, landscape painter. Um, So that's fine. So um, now I can start marking out where the big shapes are. So I'm going to use the same colour, this sort of neutral sort of brown colour. So uh, what, another thing that I use to work out composition is uh, it's just two pieces of card clipped together. Uh, don't worry about the numbers on it, they don't really mean anything. <laughs> um, so I can move this round to match the, obviously I'm using a square panel, um, I can match the uh, you know, I'm, I actually chose the panel because I set up my composition first um, and then worked out that I actually needed a square panel for this particular composition. So now I can hold this up to my subject. I can do it. Uh, I can't really show you, but uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, and just frame it, you know, uh, like you would do some people, you sometimes, you, you know, that classic thing when you see people holding up their hands to to, you know, square off a view, uh, whether photographers sometimes do it as well, of what they're going to paint. This is just a little bit more accurate. So I'm just holding up my square now and uh, just checking where, I, roughly where the elements are going to fall on the panel. Uh, so I know that's going to go to about there. I get, so uh, one thing I like to talk about in my workshop is the importance of relationships. So my understanding of painting, uh, basically you could say it comes down to the principle of relationships. Um, so, uh, so the development of skill for a painter is being able to see difference, basically, it's discerning difference. And so when you, be, what you're learning is learning, you're actually learning to see. Uh, it's like saying you, um, one thing I like to say is like you can, hear somebody but it doesn't necessarily mean you're listening to them so although we have the faculty of sight seeing is actually something to do with the mind is to do with understanding what you're seeing so um so uh, the most simple 
representation of this subject um, would be when you when you squint at the subject, you, the, the simplification when you squint, um, you or the subtle values disappear, and what you tend to be left with as you squint down is uh, simpler shapes of uh, tone or value, um, and that's basically what what the essence of the subject in terms of its value shapes. So that's what we need to try and represent in our painting initially. So that's like uh, those initial relationships. So it's actually the relationship between what's in light and what's in shadow. That's the most simple representation. Um, uh, putting aside ideas of uh, the, the aspects of um, hue and chroma for the time being. The problem is with Alla Prima is that we need to tackle all the aspects, all the visual aspects at the same time, which is the particular challenge for Alla Prima. If you're working in a classical method, um, obviously you could uh, approach that, you approach it in a more stepwise fashion. So you might do it in a monochrome under, underpainting. So you're working out the drawing and values, and then you basically would work out the colour aspects and the chroma aspects at a later time. So that gives you a more of a step-by-step um, -step approach and uh, is less of a challenge in that sense. But you obviously you have to each wait for each layer to dry and it's, it's, it's a bit of a different approach. So, but with Alla Prima, obviously you can achieve something within a, like a, a, if you're working plan air as well, um, you know, you, you've got a couple, a few hours before the light changes. So you've got to be work fairly rapidly to capture what the scene represents. Uh, I'm just trying to work out. I don't know how much of this I'm going to get done, but we'll see how we go. Sorry, I'm just uh, going through and uh, muting anybody that's not muted so I don't get any crosstalk because uh, it can be a little bit distracting. Um, yeah, you can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question or make a comment. Just that background noise can be a bit of a problem when you're on Zoom. Uh, okay. So uh, one thing um, uh, I, was, I was saying, I got distracted and started going off on a, a random, um, was um, the, the, the process of painting, another aspect of it, uh, is th as well as like relation, the relationships in relationships and learning to see, is to do uh, with this, uh, is a process of what I call um, iterative refinement. So um, what, what do I mean by that? Um, so at the moment you can see I'm basically doing some kind of drawing, uh, but I mean, it's not actually, it's not very accurate drawing, uh, but it's, it's representing basically what I can see approximately. So actually that, that's probably enough, uh, what I've got down. Um, maybe that needs to, no, that's about right. Um, so that's basically a representation of um, what I can see in the subject and the placement of the major shapes. I find that when you've got um, like a vase uh, with a floral subject like this, uh, it tends to look better if, if it's centred, if it's in the centre, this is a compositional choice, uh, which is quite subjective. Um, if it's, if it's, it's okay if it's completely off to one side, but if it's centred, but it's not, and it's a little bit off centre, it can be a bit distracting. It's like, you want, it, you want it to be centred, but it's not quite, it can be like a little bit distracting. So um, we'll see how that goes anyway. Some, I found that if something's supposed to be centred, it's got to be bang on. Otherwise, it, it can be a bit of a distraction. Uh, 
Um, but again, there's no rules with composition. Um, you, that, you might use that to your advantage in some way. Uh, you know, that sort of instability um, due to the like, relationship of elements. So again, I mean, the, the whole thing about drawing is relationships of parts, angles. Um, uh, the, the, so uh, any drawing itself, lines don't really exist in nature as such. Um, uh, they're implied. So it's when one shape meets another. Um, uh, we draw lines, and that's a representation of... Uh, it's not a reality, it's a representation of what we see and when we see either two uh, colour shapes meet or two objects, one object is against the background or etc. Um, so, um, really I don't, that's as far as I take drawing, it's really drawings about shapes for me, rather than as a drawing in the traditional sense with a, like a, a gr with graphite or charcoal. Um, so, that's that. Uh, so now, I'm squinting, squinting now, and now I need to place the major value shapes. So one thing I do is to identify uh, the darkest dark and the lightest light. You've probably heard this before. If anyone's got um, Richard's book, uh, Richard Schmidt's book, Alla Prima, uh, they'll probably, if you've read that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And in fact, I think most people normally will be familiar with that term. So what we mean when we say the lightest light is literally the lightest value that we can see in the subject and the darkest value. Um, so actually, um, in the process of interpretation, um, we might then decide that actually we don't want to paint what the darkest dark that we can see in the subject. We don't want to use the full range of value that is possible on, within our palette of colours uh, because we want to create a certain effect. Uh, so this, this a paint, we can have the effect of like having high key. So in that sense, if your value range was one to nine, say, uh, you might not use, and one was the darkest, you might not use the full range. You might say go from five to nine. So you compress the values. So then that becomes like a high key painting. Or you can have a painting that's in the middle key. Um, so that creates certain mood. Um, I'm not going to attempt that today because it's a bit tricky because you've got to be really careful with your values. So I'm going to use the full range that pretty much that's available to me. Um, so I can see the darkest dark is uh, actually one of the leaf shapes which would be in here roughly. So I can put that in. Uh, so, um, so as I was saying before, the problem with uh, Alla Prima is that we've got to tackle um, value, hue and chroma pretty much all at the same time, as well as drawing. Uh, and composition um, so there is that uh, challenge so I've just mixed in a bit of ultramarine blue and cabin yellow medium to make up a green sorry it's a bit dark on that edge of the palette oh. uh, but some things I like to do sometimes is I'll hold up the palette knife to the subject to just check uh, the the colour is roughly in the ballpark of where I want it um, this isn't like designed to match exactly what I'm seeing because um, what, what tends to happen is that you'll put a, a, a colour shape down and then that it looks okay at that point uh, in terms of value and chroma but then when you put the next one down and the next one the relationship changes because uh, it, basically they affect each other the relationship is more is in ways just as much important as the colour um, itself in isolation in fact uh, the relationship is more important it's the most important thing so but this just gives me a, a ballpark uh, to aim for as it were so, uh, I like to use uh, long flats uh, so these um, I don't want to mention the brand, they get enough advertising as it is. They're basically Rosemary & Co. Uh, ivories, extra long flax, I like them. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're good brushes, but I mean, any long flat will probably do. Um, uh, they're kind of like, um, not as stiff as a hog bristle, they're synthetic anyway. Um, and uh, they're, they're quite a bit uh, stiffer than, say, a sable. Um, so I just like I like to use flats rather than anything else. So um, 
this is now my darkest dark so i don't need to get this is probably not going to be in the right position it's a again process of iterative refinement so the drawing's got to become more refined as the painting progresses but it's roundabout in the right place hopefully um, so that's my reference point for the darkest dark now Uh, so uh, now I can put in my lightest light and I can see it's um, maybe one of these petals or maybe these petals over here. So when I squint down, it's probably these ones over here. So let's just remove a bit of that. And um, so I'm not going to use white because it has got some colour in it. So I'm going to use, uh, just from experience, I know that it will probably be uh, Rose Madder. So uh, it's actually, the actual pigment is, it's actually quincridone. So it's um, a quin quincridone rose madder, which is, um, I think traditional rose madder was uh, not permanent, but this uh, modern version is. Again, I can just hold up my palette knife just to check roughly so it has got a little bit of a yellow cast to it so just a tiny bit of uh, cadmium yellow medium yeah something like that when you uh, when I'm mixing up these uh, initial colors uh, they're sort of generalizations really uh, because there's obviously a lot more variety in there but um, obviously I, ca I can't try and tackle those subtleties yet I've got to simplify everything as I was saying, so that basically this is a generalization of what I'm seeing, the relationship. So let's just put that in there. In fact, there's another lightest light over here. It's, it's actually a bit cooler. So, okay. So now, I've got these two uh, value references, if you like. Um, I can uh, maybe tackle uh, several things, like different things I could tackle. The background value is important because it, it gives um, meaning to obviously these two, well, the three, three values I've got really. These, I'm counting them as one value really because um, they are pretty much. Um, So the background is the value, but it's darker than this, and it's cooler. Um, so I could put in a note for that. The other thing I notice is that uh, this, if I treat this whole shape in here, which is in shadow, as one value, it's actually darker than the background. So maybe I'll, I'll put that in. It's probably not going to be right at this point, and it will need adjusting. So I'm using uh, Rose Matter again. And I use some cabin yellow medium. And so uh, the lighting, by the way, that I'm using is um, an LED panel. If I just spin round, I can show you that. Sorry to blind you. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's just an LED panel, and um, the uh, I prefer to use. Um, artificial light in the studio just because I don't have north facing light um, so the sun sets where the sun comes through it sets uh, in the west uh, so in the afternoon I get light I can get sunlight streaming in and it it can is it can be problematic because it's not a very constant light um, so that's the reason why um, I use artificial light here um, if you've got north light um, natural light is so much nicer to paint by uh, if you're lucky enough to have it. Uh, I do like to paint outside now and again because it's just the light is just so different from what you can achieve in the studio. Uh, but the challenges of painting outside of uh, you, you the, the environment not being is not a very steady environment so it, it just makes everything much more difficult. So um, especially if you, when you're learning I always advise to have uh, an artificial light source because it, it just makes things much easier. It's hard enough as it is without introducing 
the problems of working uh, with um, a natural light source unless it's a steady one, a light north light. Um, so now I'm studying my subject and uh, so I know that this has got to be lighter than this value shape or this uh, leaf uh, shape here. So I'm just going to add a little bit of white in and maybe some paint grey. That might be too much. I need to put some more white out. I don't know why I haven't done that. I um, put two piles of white out because uh, one I use for the uh, what are traditionally called the warmer colours like yellow um, and red and then one I'll use for cooler like greens and blues just because inevitably as you you know uh, painting goes on they will become conta contaminated uh, to a certain extent um, and um, I like to avoid that if possible for as long as possible um, Uh, let's just see what that looks like. Yeah, something like that. It looks about right. If I keep it thin when I apply it, it shouldn't be a problem. It's, if I apply thick paint too um, thick paint uh, too quickly, so I can just uh, then it will cause problems later. So it's just I think it's just down to experience. You want you don't want it too thin, but you don't want it too thick. <laughs> It's sort of a Goldilocks thing. Uh, so we're getting people arriving very late. Uh, I'm just having to keep stopping to admit them. I suppose I could ignore it, but... So when I, when I'm looking at my subject, I can see um, you can probably you can see it in the photograph actually. There's uh, towards the centre is higher chroma uh, and warmer, and then as it gets out towards the edge, the colour temperature uh, changes. So colour temperature is um, a reference to a change in hue. So basically, it's going from uh, it's like a ready warm ready yellowish colour uh, to a cooler, uh, heading more towards the blue part of the spectrum on this outside edge. But um, I'm not worried about that at the moment. I'm just concentrating on getting the overall general um, hue, value, and chroma uh, at this stage. Um, so as as a one shape. So that's that. So the complexity of the relationships is build is starting to build up now. So what what I'm trying to do is uh, interpret it my subject until I've completed what's called the blocking. So I've got all basically the whole uh, area composition is filled with colour shapes um, and they're all in good relation to, to each other. So there's no detail. Um, hopefully I can complete this stage within the hour. Um, it's because I'm nuttering on so it's taking me a bit longer. <laughs> So I'm mixing up um, a value now for the background. Notice um, I'm talking about value and not colour really, although obviously I'm tackling colour as well. Uh, but my main priority has got to be value. Uh, so it, I've used pan grey and white basically, uh, so that's probably too dark. And I'm going to use a bit of this um, mid-tone, it's slightly warmer. 
yeah. So I just warmed it up ever so slightly. So Paints Grey um, is actually a mixture of burnt, se well it varies depending on the brand, but it's a mixture of ultramarine blue, ivory black and burnt sienna I think, usually it can be other pigments. But it tends to be a, a cooler sort of, uh, well it's, a, it's just a generally cool sort of neutral, uh, almost black colour. I mean I could use ivory black as well. Um, ivory black is not quite as transparent though I don't think. Um, anyway. See what that looks like. I've got a feeling that this is probably not going to be dark enough, but we'll see. Oh, I don't know, that looks about right. I might have to go a bit darker. See, I've got to be careful not to go too light on the background because. Although there is, it's slightly darker over here because the way the light's falling on the wall behind, it's darker, slightly darker on this side. So I know, I mean, I can sort of, sort of indicate that. Mix a bit more of this in. Um, so oh, one thing I was saying about the light is actually it's um, it's a sort of a coolish. Uh, well, it's actually uh, about six thousand Kelvin, which is a bit cooler than daylight, basically. So daylight is around about five to five fifty, uh, five fifty, uh, five thousand fifty um, Kelvin. So uh, light temperature is me measured in kelvins. Um, so that what that basically means, anyway, uh, besides the <laughs> the science of it, um, is that um, when you've got cool light. The general principle is that it will tend to make um, the shadows warmer um, and uh, vice versa. So when you've got warm light, the, the shadows would be correspondingly cooler. Um, but that doesn't always apply. <laughs> you have to look at each situation um, on its own because there can be colour reversals sometimes. When, Especially because of reflected light, and um, uh, so reflected light is when light bounce bounces off an object uh, into the shadow area of another, uh, and it can warm it up or cool it down depending on the um, actual uh, pigmentation of the object itself. And it can be quite a sort of a big effect. Like um, you can sometimes see this like if you've got a sort of golden cornfield or something like that and the sky's quite low even though it's overcast the light can reflect back up into the clouds and warm it up uh, that's a sort of a plan air instance uh, but yeah that sort of thing does happen quite a lot outside um, but not so much in the studio because there's not as much uh, opportunity for, there's less light for a start to bounce around um, compared to outside, so you don't get so much of those colour reversals happening. But one thing, uh, one thing's about uh, florals though, is because of the translucency of the petals, you get the light basically transmitted through the petal that can cause uh, certain kinds of colour reversals, which is similar to what you find outside. Um, so that's quite interesting. I think one one of the things I like about, especially roses, is particularly noticeable. One because of the um, daffodils are the same, um, because of the thinness and the translucency of the petals, um, and the various pigmentations obviously in the actual petals that you can get, uh, you get these really interesting luminous effects, um, which you don't get with other subjects, like generally with still life. Um, Alright, I've got some questions, uh, just let me see... Uh, uh, Nancy asks, will this be recording and accessible? I've got my toes mixed up. Uh, yeah, I am recording it. I haven't quite decided where, what I'm going to do with it yet. Um, but it might be... Um, I might put it on YouTube uh, at some point, uh, depending how it goes. Um, I'll have to see. Um, 
Lugiani says, Alex, what did you mix with Payne's Grey besides white? Uh, I don't actually remember. <laughs> uh, I think it, oh yeah, that's right. It was uh, it was just uh, I was explaining at the start of the session that it's this uh, sort of a mid-tone grey. Uh, it's basically a mix of every colour on my palette. So I keep all the colour mixes up on my palette. I just scrape it all up, mix it together, and keep it for later. And I just use that as like a, a general sort of mud colour, um, which is quite useful for basically controlling chroma. Um, so, so you don't have to throw your paint away. Uh, I used to just throw it all away, but uh, it's actually quite useful um, just to have as an accessory. Um, uh, I use basically use paints grey for the same reason to control chroma really. Okay, uh, so the next stage, uh, so yeah, so I was just blocking that in. So I'm going to put this uh, sort of, um, which is plywood table in there. I think this value is about right. Uh, this will probably need to go darker, but um, it's, as a general value, it looks okay. It's slightly darker than the background, so that's fine. Sorry V, it must be something your end, if you can't hear, because um, I think everybody else can hear okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to put in the rest of these leaf shapes, I think, now. Um, so I'm just using that previous mix that I had before. So they're actually slightly uh, higher in value. So I could just use the same value, but I want to lighten it slightly, something like that maybe. There's a bit of cobalt blue in that. Yeah, something like that. So I'm squinting at my subject. Uh, so even though these are separate leaf shapes, I'm, I'm basically treating them as if uh, they're all one shape. I'm not overly being too accurate with my drawing. I'm, I'm trying to be accurate, not like going crazy and just like putting paint everywhere but uh, I know it's not going to be completely right and I'll probably have to adjust it as I go along which is half the course without a Prima okay. So what I'm thinking I'll probably do is just, I'll probably carry on with this um, demo because obviously I'm not going to complete this painting during the time. Normally it takes me, it can take me anywhere from three to six hours to do painting depending on the complexity, sometimes longer. Um, some are quick, some are not. can I tell you. Um, another thing I use is uh, another, a thing I picked up a tip from uh, something Richard Schmidt uses actually uh, or used I should say um, is a walking cane. Um, my arm's not that steady. Uh, I don't need it when I'm doing the blocking because I'm not being accurate but if I need to do accurate drawing I'll rest my arm on the cane. So um, you may have seen the thing called a mall stick which is like a stick with a sort of like a soft cloth ball on the end but obviously you need to put that on usually we put that on the paint a part of the painting that's dry but obviously with a prima the painting is not dry <laughs> so that's not really an option so uh, this works quite well because i can just hook it over the back 
of the easel. Let's zoom out. Yeah, so I can just hook it over the back and uh, you know rest my my hand on it like that. I don't, I don't need it at the moment. Uh, so let's block in the value for the table. Actually, I should probably do this other rose. So I can see um, part of this rose is in shadow, but the shadow shape of this rose is lighter than the shadow shape of this one. Uh, but actually, um, parts of it are the same value, but the, the part in here is darker. So maybe to stop myself getting confused, I could put in a shape in here just to indicate that slightly darker value. Something like that. If I keep it thin. So you can see now that um, I'm basically tackling the drawing or the, sh the, sh the shape, this is the shapes, at the same time as the value, um, as basically at the same time as the value. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of creeping up. This is this process of iterative, iterative refinement. Um, it's like um, circular refinement, I suppose, is another word for it. An iterative, quite difficult to say. Um, okay, so now I can compare this value shape. Um, yeah, so that's going to need to be, yeah. So I'm just talking to myself. So when I paint, I'll be talking to myself in my head or out <laughs> asking questions about what I can see. So I need to, okay. Just gonna mix up the value for that. So I can see um, this uh, shadow shape in here uh, is substantially, it's probably warmer because it's receiving more of the light coming from the left um, um, as well as being lighter in value so it, it's actually warming up because the light's travelling through and uh, being transmitted through the petals that doesn't, this colour doesn't feel quite right actually it's not too far off let's try that Again, it's a generalisation. There's a lot more variety in that shadow than uh, I can um, indicate. Well, all that I even want to indicate at this stage. Um, let's put that in. That's probably going to be okay. So I'm just checking. Squint, I'm squinting down at my subject. Slightly. I'm trying to work out where the shadow shows. So you can see I'm having to paint back into that a bit. Uh, like so um, there's sort of there's a, there's another thing I do which uh, describe is like there's two modes of seeing effectively. There's probably more than two. Um, so one mode is where you look at your subject and you see everything as basically as flat two D shapes. Uh, as basi basically as 2D shapes um, and they're just value shapes they don't you don't see in terms of form so um, the other way is, is literally to see in terms of form so you imagine you try to imagine in your mind's eye when you look at a rose it having a structure like a sculpture uh, and then you imagine what that if you simplified that sculpture imagine you were doing a portrait of a head uh, you've probably seen like those Asaro busts 
where the planes of the skull or you know the face it's everything the head's very simplified into planar structure so you can do this the, the same approach of simplification with the structure of a rose or basically anything you paint so you simplify it into a, a sphere a cube um you know um an octagon or whatever or some kind of polyhedra so um basically when you look at a rose what you what you see is this sphere but it's been flattened to a certain extent and different flowers have different sort of like geometric structures so uh what you can this kind of seeing in this way is quite helpful as well so it helps you understand what where the planes where the light's hitting it and um how the value is changing as the 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 structure the form changes the planes change uh, obviously it's a little bit more complex because we've got all these spiky bits sticking out but so but we've got to try and that's why we try to imagine it the form has been simplified so basically we've got a plane here which is receiving quite a lot of light and then although there's many petals in here uh, a generalization is that that plane is at almost at 90 degrees so that one going that way so um, if you can see in those two different ways one is in terms of flat shapes uh, where they literally just uh, imagine that's a flat shape and then the one next to it is a flat shape um, and then the other way is to see it is in terms of three dimensions so they're both quite helpful um, and it's good to be able to sort of switch between those two sort of modes there's probably others actually but I think those two are the main ones um. I think I can put the value shape in for the table now. So, so I can see the value here is lighter than this shadow shape, but obviously it's going to be darker than the, the lightest light of these parts, but it's also lighter than these leaf shapes. So that tells you what, roughly what value it should be. Um, I've just got to mix up an appropriate colour. Well, it will be more specific, uh, an appropriate um, hue and chroma. So I'm just going to use, a, actually I could use a bit of this uh, just to control the chroma because it's not as chromatic as want to be careful that I don't make it too chromatic compared to the roses. Just use a bit of this transparent oxide red, something like that. It's a bit warmer than that, so it's a bit more enough that transparent oxide red. Maybe some cad red. Okay, that is pretty much uh, the blocking. I know I've sort of obliterated where that bottle was, but it's probably going to have to move anyway. Um, I don't use strings, I don't paint that way, uh, Jill. Um, 
I know some painters that do. Um, in my way of thinking, I don't know beforehand what colours I'm going to need. I mean, you can get roughly an idea of what colours you're going to need, but until they're actually on the painting in relationship, you don't know whether they're correct. So if I pre pre-mix lots of strings, I'm probably going to end up having to alter those, and I've wasted all that, well, not wasted it, but um, and then kind of putting myself in a box that I've got to use that predetermined, and I don't know beforehand what I'm going to need until it's actually on the surface. Now, having said that, I realise there are painters who use that method very successfully, so but I'm just saying that's the way I do it. Um, I can think of a few painters that use strings and they make great paintings, so it obviously works for them. So, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't pre-mix my colours, basically, which is what strings, string theory <laughs> is all about. Uh, okay. So what would I do next? Uh, basically, uh, maybe check my composition. So just holding up my thing to my subject again. So actually I wish everything was a bit moved down really, to be honest. So um, basically I don't want it up that high. So everything I'd, I'd prefer if it was lower down. So. Uh, I can just, I'm not happy with my drawing, so, you know, at this stage there's no great loss if I decide actually I want everything to move down a bit. Um, you know, uh, so the wonderful thing about uh, oil paint, uh, it's very forgiving like this, uh, and I can just uh, wipe it off. So uh, I'll just redraw that bit, uh, reapply those colours. Um, I'll carry on a little bit further because uh, some people joined late and also I didn't get started. So if you want to hang around, um, I should have finished now, but I'll carry on for a few minutes more. Um, just in case you want to ask any questions. Um, so, um, so don't be afraid to uh, correct um, something. There's nothing worse though when you've painted a passage uh, and you're really happy with it and it looks really good, but it's actually in the wrong place. There's nothing worse than that. So you've got to be, um, don't be too precious, you know. Um, and uh, you yeah, know, there is that tendency you've painted something, you think you've got to stay with it. It's not the case at all. Um, so, so I'm just thinking everything neat would be better if every it all came down quite a bit. Um, I guess because I was rushing, um, because it's a demo. Um, so what, middle of that flower, out there. it's not that far out, but the top of the leaf should have been there. So I'm just using my finger now to mark in the paint rather than adding more paint. So I mean the bound the boundary of that flower is that so this is a drawing issue really. Um, it won't take much correcting. So instead of trying to paint over it, so the paint will get thicker and thicker, uh, that will cause problems. So basically what I need to do is remove paint and then repaint that. Uh, just for those who join late, just um, mentioning again that I do have a um, painting sale uh, on my website at the moment. Uh, it's 40% off some paintings um, and that ends tonight. Uh, also, the other thing is that in August I've got a three-day workshop. Um, it's spread over a three-week period, so 
um, and it will be on three Sundays. But the um, as well as being progressive, a step by step approach to how I do Ella Prima, um, there will also be uh, obviously there will be uh, feedback on the work that you do, and I'll be setting assignments, etc. Uh, so I'll give you um, feedback on the work that you do. So um, so it's not just a demonstration; it, it goes into a lot more detail and um, about my philosophy and the practical aspects of how I paint, which I can't really go into here because there's not enough time. Um, so that, that workshop is also listed on my uh, website if you're interested. So I'm just, the reason why nothing appears to be happening is that I'm just holding up this card just to check where I want things to come to. Uh, basically, well, I need to correct the drawing. Uh, it's actually not too bad. Um, so. I think this was all right, actually. Hang on. The other thing you can just mark. Great, you can just use the the back, of, you know, the the other end of your brush just to mark. If you're not sure about shapes, you know. Um, so yeah, so this drawing issue is a sh a, an issue of uh, the shapes not being quite right. But aside from that, it was okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that not, should be a major problem. So I can just uh, redraw those now, or repaint them, I should say. Um, so that was my darkest dark in there. Oh, the card thing, sure. Yeah, um, yeah. It's just two pieces of card. Nothing. Uh, it's not rocket science. <laughs> it's just two pieces of L-shaped card um, clipped together. It's just a uh, useful for working out, uh, you know, your composition. And if I'd been more careful when I started, uh, I wouldn't be doing. <laughs> wouldn't have to repaint this section. Now. <coughs> but these things happen. So I'm basically I'm, I'm not I'm just using uh, this uh, paper towel just to mark where the lights should go. Can be quite a helpful way of working as well. Just because um, it can get quite tricky uh, to continue just putting more and more paint on top. So um, I want to avoid that uh, until later. Uh, no, I'm not using solvent, um, Nancy. Um, I don't use solvent in the studio because um, it caused, uh, well, I think it caused problems with my eyes, actually. Um, I had uh, some problems with my eyes last year, uh, so I decided it probably best to uh, look after my eyes as a painter, uh, and uh, I sort of banned the solvent from the studio. Um, so what I use now, it took a little while to get used to, is... Um, Walnut oil, I just uh, basically, I dip my brush into this pot of walnut oil, um, but I don't, uh, I don't, um, dip, uh, I don't wash, swirl my brush around in there. I basically dip it in, and then I take the brush to this other little pot and swirl it around in there, and then just wipe it on the rag to remove these excess um, paint. 
So one I was actually a really good solvent, as well as being a painting medium itself. It's also used uh, in paints um, uh, as like a binder, but um, it make it's actually a really good solvent and uh, re removes the oil, the paint from the brush really well. Uh, the only thing is that unlike OMS or Terps or whatever, the uh, paint particles won't settle out, they'll stay in suspension, hence that's why I use a pot. Uh, the big pot, I don't swirl the brush around in the big pot because it would just turn into mud very quickly. So I, I transfer a little bit of the oil and then wash my brush in that smaller pot. And then I can just dispose of that, um, you know, as needed. And it's only a small amount of oil. So. Yeah, that that's just yeah, um, the second part is just walnut oil, and then this one is my medium, which is um, a mix of OMS and uh, stand oil, uh, linseed stand oil. Um, so uh, getting back on track. I'm just using a bit of Payne's Grey. I'm just going to indicate where this uh, little jar is. Uh, so as I was mentioning before, it's, it's, I find it when something central like that, it needs to be quite accurately in the centre. Otherwise it can look a bit odd. Still got people wanting to join. They must have got their times wrong. Um. So I need to. I think I need to mix up some more for the background colour. Then I can refine my shapes a little bit more. So um, one thing I do when I'm putting this background value in, and I, I do, I'll do this a few times probably as the painting progresses, is that I cut back into where I've already painted, and this is the refinement of the drawing. So this is part of um, what I was talking about, uh, this process of iter iterative refinement. Um, where you're tackling all the sort of uh, what I call the objective aspects of painting, uh, kind of simultaneously, really. Um, this stage I squint uh, quite a lot although you can't see me doing that you can see how I cut back in there just to get that shape I can probably zoom in a bit so you can see better Yeah, sorry, Sandy, you've actually missed the whole session <laughs> because it started over and over. I'm actually running over, but I'm going to 
I'm just going to carry it on a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I'll probably, if the painting works out, I might upload it to YouTube. So um, if you don't follow me on YouTube, um, you can do that and then see if it appears at some point. It's not going to be straight away because these things take a little while to process anyway. Um, so, but yeah, I'll, I'll probably upload it to YouTube at some point. Um, just, just uh, if you subscribe, you'll pr probably get a notification uh, when it's on there. So yeah, I'm happier with that now, I think. Um, so I've got a sort of a general impression of the subject. Um, admittedly, it's very simple. Um, so, but from here, I've got a good basis to build upon and start refining. Um, I've got my lightest light, my darkest dark. Um, I've got indications of Proma, um, the relationship between the, the lights and the shadows, and uh, the general shapes, uh, which all of those things will need refining uh, as the painting uh, continues. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty happy with the way that looks at the moment. So uh, I'm going to finish there now. Um, so uh, I'm going to carry on with this painting um, uh, today and probably tomorrow and um, when the recordings um, complete I'll upload it um, I'll just mention again I do have a sale on today on my website uh, with 40% off uh, which ends tonight and also there is a workshop in August if you want to have a look at that uh, three-day workshop thank you everyone for joining I hope that was useful um, 